Good morning and welcome to the 22nd meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee for 2015. I uh, can ask everyone to make sure that mobile phones and other electronic devices are silent or switched to airplane mode. Um, the first item on the agenda is a decision in taking items 5 and 6 in private. Item 5 is a review of the draft call for evidence of the draft budget and item 6 is a discussion about digital working in committees. Is that agreed? Thank you. Item two on our agenda uh, is consideration legislative consent memorandum. Um, it's in relation to the Welfare Reform and Work Bill. And this morning we have with us uh, Alec Neill, the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pensioners' Rights. Uh, w welcome, Alex. And with him is Caroline Cowan, who's the head of Tackling Poverty Team Scottish Government, and Gillian Cross, who's the Policy Advisor, Tackling Poverty Team in the Scottish Government. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. Uh, as all members will be aware, the UK Government's Welfare Reform and Work Bill is currently making its way through the UK Parliament. The bill contains significant changes to welfare benefits, tax credits and social housing levels and introduces new duties on the UK Parliament to report and progress towards achieving full employment, the apprenticeships target in England and the Troubled Families Programme in England. However, I'm here today to seek legislative consent for the elements of the bill that relate to the Child Poverty Act 2010. I fundamentally disagree with the changes to the Act which were proposed by the bill for a number of reasons, and I therefore secured amendments to remove Scotland from the UK Government's proposed approach. I will outline for the Committee the changes in my opposition to them briefly, and will be happy to answer any questions the Committee may have. Under the provisions of the bill, the Child Poverty Act 2010 will be renamed the Life Chances Act. The UK Government will no longer be required to report on income targets. Instead, they will be required to report annually on life chances. This means reporting on the number of children living in workless households and on educational attainment at 16 in England. I believe that income is a fundamental driver of poverty and I therefore see the removal of income-based targets as totally unacceptable. Replacing these with a target focused on worklessness completely ignores in-work poverty, which as we know is a growing problem and affects 120,000 children in Scotland. At a UK level, 67% of children in poverty live in a household where one or more adults is working. The Scottish Government doesn't feel we can support a child poverty tar target which doesn't take those children into account. The second issue is the changes that the UK Government is proposing to the Child Poverty and Social Mobility Commission. This will be renamed the Social Mobility Commission in one fell swoop, removing the child poverty aspects of the remit. The new Commission will report in progress towards improving social mobility in the UK as well as promoting social mobility in England. The Scottish Government has worked closely with the Commission in the past and we feel that their role in scrutinising the Government's tackling poverty efforts have been invaluable. The child poverty elements of the Commission's remit are fundamental to its work and to remove them at a time when child poverty remains such a priority issue does not seem appropriate. We have therefore negotiated amendments which mean that the duties on Scottish ministers under the Child Poverty Act will be repealed and we will not be part of the new Social Mobility Commission. This is not a decision we have taken lightly, of course. I am extremely committed to tackling poverty and improving social mobility in Scotland. I have discussed my decision with Alan Milburn, Chair of the Social Mobility Commission, and I have stressed my commitment to continued informal cooperation with the Commission where appropriate and possible. All of this means that the Scottish Government must look forward to develop a Scottish approach to tackling child poverty. We will do this by working closely with our Ministerial Advisory Group on Child Poverty, our Independent Poverty Advisor, this Committee and other stakeholders. I'm confident that we can build upon and revise the innovative and robust measurement framework that we already have in place to come up with a distinct Scottish approach, one which genuinely addresses the issue of child poverty rather than sweeping it under the carpet. Thank you, Convener. Okay, uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, you, you say that um, you wish a, a different set of indicators in, in Scotland. You, you're not convinced of um, what has been proposed about children living in workless households and educational attainment at the age of 16. Would it be possible to do what you propose but also retain 
those would it not be of some value knowing um, about failures in relation to educational attainment? Well, obviously, we're uh, engaged in a debate just now specifically on educational attainment and how the best way is to close the gap in educational attainment. But there are such divergences between the Scottish education system and the English education system that how they measure their attainment is obviously different from how we measure ours. So any measurement of attainment would be the subject and is the subject, as you know, uh, of consideration by the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning. And it's an issue being addressed by the Wider Access Commission as well. So we believe that since we have a separate Scottish education system, uh, it is in any case better to measure educational progress here in Scotland as we do using a whole range of measurements. Yeah, I understand that. But could you not use those Scottish measurements and still have the target of measuring educational attainment because there are real concerns about uh, collectively uh, of relating to all of us a, a failure to close the educational gap so would it not be wise using Scottish measurements to have a target in Scotland uh, relating to educational attainment? As, as you know, the Education Secretary and the First Minister are looking at this very issue at the moment. The issue is whether anything like that should be in this bill, and we believe it would be inappropriate. What's in the bill at the moment is very much geared to the English education system and not to a, a, what's happening in Scotland, or indeed, a, I don't think it covers Wales either. And Wales, as you know, has taken a similar position to this bill as we have. Yeah, um, perhaps I'm failing to understand, but is it not possible to have the same target but to use Scottish indicators and Scottish measurements? Well, theory is possible, but obviously we are engaged in the debate on what exactly the target should be in terms of educational attainment, how they should be measured, when they should be measured, what metrics should be used to, to measure those. And, you know, the, we've got all the legislative power we need to build that into our own legislation and make it part and parcel of a, you know, wider, a widening access and closing educational attainment gap strategy. We, there's no added advantage in having a... a one of those targets at age 16 in this bill. Will the Cabinet Secretary for Education bring back to this Parliament a proposal to measure uh, gaps in educational attainment at the age of 16? That, that, as you know, is all part and parcel of the consultations that are going on at the present time in the work of the wider uh, Access Commission. So the, the Cabinet Secretary for Education will come forward to Parliament in due course about how and when uh, these things should be measured if any changes are required. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, Kevin and then Christina. Uh, thank you, Convener, uh, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, the four UK Children and Young People's Commissioners have uh, expressed their ire at the changes in, in this new uh, UK bill. Could I ask you, Cabinet Secretary, in terms of um, the... the uh, the formulation that you are going to undertake in terms of Scottish measurements of, of these issues, that you will ensure that the Children and Young People's Commissioner here uh, is involved uh, in that consultation uh, and that his views are taken into account when you uh, finally decide how you are going to to carry on in this regard? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, the Children's Commissioner plays a, a significant role in terms of uh, all aspects of policy towards children and young people. But our, uh, our measurement uh, framework was set out in our annual report on child poverty in October 2015. And you may remember that when the original Act was passed, uh, initiated by Gordon Brown in 2010, there were four specific aspects to measuring child poverty. And, of course, we believe those four aspects are still very, very relevant today. But we have developed a more comprehensive, and we believe a more robust set of uh, measurements and a measurement framework for actually measuring progress on child poverty specifically. Um, but, um, as I say, we um, absolutely agree with their assessment. Christina? Much convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Morning. Uh, th thanks for your explanation uh, this morning. Um, I noticed that uh, Ian Duncan Smith proposes to, to measure um, educational attainment, worklessness, and, uh, and addiction. Um, 
Would you agree with me that in many cases these are the symptoms of poverty rather than the causes of poverty? And how, you know, maybe our government would maybe refocus that? I'm not saying that these things should not be taken into consideration, but how do we refocus what we do to, you know, recognise that sometimes these are the symptoms of poverty rather than the causes, and how do we reverse that? Absolutely, and as I said in my introduction, I mean, the, it is very, very clear from the analysis we've done and the work done particularly by our independent advisor on poverty in Scotland that by far the biggest challenge in Scotland in terms of poverty, and indeed in the rest of the UK, is in-work poverty. Um, and that is not just about the adults, it's about the children affected by in-work poverty. 67% across the UK of children who are in poverty are living in households where somebody's working, and the figure's about 59% in Scotland. So no matter which geography you're looking at, Scotland or the whole of the UK, no matter which way you cut it, in-work poverty is by far the biggest challenge, and yet in-work poverty basically is being totally excluded uh, from targets or from the provisions in this bill. So what this bill, I think, is part and parcel of a wider agenda of uh, trying to paint people who are uh, unemployed as uh, come some kind of skivers. We don't agree with that philosophy or with that approach or that analysis at all. Glad to hear that, Cab Cabinet Secretary. When we uh, talk about vulnerable young people, I notice that um, in the uh, legislation that they'll, they talk about the most disadvantaged pupils at the age of 16. But we changed our focus in Scotland a few years ago when we reformed the children's hearing system to measure vulnerability to the age of 18 and maybe longer if, they have, if it's young people coming for care or coming for a very, very uh, seriously um, you know, uh, background where, there's, where welfare is the issue rather than criminality. Um, and I'm just wondering how, how we'll measure that, because that's a gap now you've got between 16 and 18, where for some young people that's part of the most vulnerable time of their life. Uh, we believe our approach has to be to measure uh, these things throughout uh, the child's life and young person's life, and not just at one particular point. You know, the fourth element in the Gordon Brown Act in 2010 on child poverty was about persistent poverty. And one of the things, clearly, if you look at any analysis of poverty, either in Scotland or in the UK, there are people who are in and out of poverty. Now, a lot of the people are in poverty, out of poverty, and back in poverty because of their circumstances. But there's also a hardcore group of people who are in persistent poverty, who never actually get out of poverty or out of the statistics at any time in their lives. So if you're looking at poverty, then clearly poverty is something that is no, no respect of age, um, because clearly we have people in poverty right through from children born into poverty to people who die in poverty. Uh, and the other point in all of this is very clearly all the evidence suggests, and I know the committee has previously heard evidence, I think from Harry Burns and others, about the biology of poverty, showing that uh, the uh, level of poverty very often is determined when the child is in the womb, let alone when the child is born, and the life chances of a child are pretty well determined within the first year of that child's life. So to wait till 16 and put all the emphasis on the age of 16, uh, there's nothing wrong with measuring it at 16, but that is only one uh, snapshot uh, in a lifetime. Uh, of poverty or being in and out of poverty. So we believe the whole approach embodied in this bill uh, and you know, taking the remit of child poverty away from the Commission included is a, is a mistake and is deprioritising child poverty as an issue. Uh, and we believe far from deprioritising it, it is a top priority to tackle child poverty in our country. Thanks very much, Cabinet Secretary. I've got a final, final point just on that, you know, transition period. Do you think the changes that are proposed to, to welfare benefits for um, 18 to 25 year olds, you know, no housing benefit, um, some of the changes as far as tax credits and all of that has an impact on those young people who are probably at a stage where they're starting their families? Um, so that, you know, completes that cycle of, of, of poverty. Do you think that that's, that's wrong headed? And what's the Scottish Government's answer to it? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, very clearly, uh, young people, I think, have fared very, very badly from the budget earlier this year and from the spending review earlier this year. And although the headline reforms to the tax credit system uh, were a, you, there was a U-turn on that, there's still a lot in this bill in particular which is going to damage the level of poverty, damage people who are in poverty. You know, the freezing of benefits until 2020, 
the limiting of uh, tax credits to ch people with only two children, uh, and the range of measures that uh, you mentioned, Christina, all of these things are going to be, I believe, be detrimental to the fight against poverty. Now, the people I meet don't want to be living in poverty. They don't want to be unemployed. They don't want to be disabled or uh, sick. They, they want uh, to be able to work if they can, and they want to get a job, and they want to have a decent income. Our emphasis should be in helping people out of poverty, but not by ignoring the problem or trying to underestimate the problem, but by being upfront and honest about the scale of the problem and therefore the scale of the challenge that we face. Sorry, can I just one really, really quick final point? What's the Scottish Government's thoughts on the third child conditionality and the, the issue about a woman having to prove she's been raped? Well, my view is that this is because of the changes to the tax credits that are being made and we wouldn't make those kind of agree with those changes in the first place, so the issue would not arise. But I think, really, it's a very good example of how ill-thought out these proposals are. Much thanks, Convener. Mike Johnson, then Neil Finlay. Thank you. Uh, by adopting a different measuring framework and coming up with a different set of indicators, uh, we're going to have some divergence of the information uh, that is being kept. Now, welfare payments effectively operate outside the Barnet envelope. They come according to need. Is there a danger that by measuring different figures in Scotland, we might ultimately get a disagreement or a divergence in entitlement in Scotland, uh, north and south of the border? Well, the, the entitlement is uh, not necessarily... But the, the, if you look at the correlation between entitlement and the level of poverty and many of the benefits, there's a very thin correlation, Alec. Uh, it should be a much stronger correlation so that the people who are in poverty are the ones who uh, get the most help. But very clearly, if you look at the measures in this bill in relation to the further changes to tax credits, to the freezing of benefits, to the changes for 18 to 25-year-olds, these are all groups where the levels of poverty are very high, and yet these are the people who are losing the most benefits through this bill. So the correlation at the moment is, in terms of policy determined uh, by the UK Cabinet, uh, the correlation is very, very thin indeed. We're at the very beginning of a process at the moment where the Scottish Government in future years will begin to participate more significantly in uh, contributing towards the welfare budget uh, and we may see new benefits uh, evolve. Is the divergence in the information that we record likely to be an area that could be exploited to reduce the UK contribution towards benefit payments in Scotland and pass the burden progressively to the Scottish Government? Obviously fiscal agreement that has to be negotiated and is in the process of being negotiated between the Scottish Government and the UK Government is designed partly to address that issue as well as many other issues uh, so that we end up in a situation that, um, that if we take a different policy decision uh, in relation to any matter that there's no detrimental impact on the Scottish budget or indeed on the individual. You may remember that uh, when Henry MacLeish introduced uh, free personal care, the then Secretary of State for Social Security, Alistair Darling, decided that all those receiving free personal care would no longer be entitled to attendance allowance, which today would be worth about £40 million to the affected people. And similarly, when we declared in 2007 that we wanted to give uh, and extend the benefits that foster parents enjoy to those involved in kinship care, we were told by the then Secretary of State for Social Security that uh, if we gave additional money to kinship carers, it would be taken off those people, uh, every penny would be taken off in the benefit system from the UK government. So a key part of all of this is that with the decisions we make in future on the new devolved powers and indeed existing ones, there should be no a uh, consequential a diminution in either our budget or in the individual budget of anyone who's a benefit recipient as a result of decisions we take. So uh, the, the different way in which we measure it shouldn't impact on policy, in my view, at all in that respect. The, is it not the case, though, that the Cabinet Secretary described previous events that were clearly understood because we had common benchmarking and that if we have different benchmarking, 
that that's simply likely to open up an area of contention in future fiscal negotiation? See, the decision that was taken to take away the attendance allowance for people getting personal um, free, free uh, personal care had nothing to do with benchmarking or anything else. It was pure spite, quite frankly. And similarly, the decision that if we had at that time introduced kinship carers and given them the same benefits as foster parents, that, that was not based on any measurement other than pure spite as well. So uh, I would say that actually uh, history doesn't tell us anything about the future. The important point is to establish a guarantee of no detrimental impact either in the Scottish Government's budget or in the budgets of individual claimants as a result of any policy differences between Scotland and the rest of the UK. And I'm going to ask Caroline to come in and give you some of the technical aspects of this. It's just to clarify that the statistics that are used for a lot of these, the households below average income, will continue to be collected across the UK. Um, I think what's really changing is that they'll no longer be used to inform targets, policy targets, but those baseline statistics will continue. Thank you. OK, Neil Finlay. I'm sure I heard this morning you commending the work of Gordon Brown and, and saying we have all the power we need. Um, can I congratulate you? On yes, you did. Uh, you <laughs> said we have all the power we need to In deal with. In to the narrow aspect. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I would commend you on getting out of the right side of the bed this morning. Uh, um, but can I say in relation to poverty uh, and commitments to eradicating it, and I don't, I don't question that one bit, but why has the report into inequality uh, as reported in the media at the weekend, been joined the growing list of reports that's going to be delayed until after the election. You're talking about the multiple index of multiple deprivation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a decision which was taken in April this year by the chief statistician on the advice of the advisory committee on multiple deprivation. It's not a political decision. The decision is taken by the chief statistician under the UK Code of Statistics. And I'm sure the convener, as a former minister, will uh, be able to confirm that in occasions like that, we are not even consulted. The decision is taken and then announced in this case by the chief statistician for Scotland. The de reason the decision was taken was in relation to a consultation about the geographic definitions being used in the index of multiple deprivation and as to whether it was providing an accurate enough assessment of what it was intending to indicate and to report on. That consultation has now, uh, the time wasn't completed on schedule, and that was the reason the chief statistician gave for his decision uh, to delay the report. And the earliest he's indicated, that, and he said this many months ago, the earliest the report will now be available will be May 2016. But that's a non-political, independent decision by the chief statistician, and uh, ministers were not involved in that decision at all. When, when it is um, published, then, uh, are you confident that it will show that the uh, inequality and poverty gap is narrowing in Scotland? No, I'm not confident of that at all. I think when you look at the impact of the tax and benefit changes by the, made by the UK government, uh, the, the impact of those may well have made inequality more of a problem and poverty more of a problem. We've just been talking about young people aged between 18 and 25 uh, who are reliant on benefit. I don't see how you can anticipate that poverty will decline if their benefits are being withdrawn completely or reduced or frozen. Do you expect the, um, uh, the gap uh, or, or the performance in Scotland to be better or worse than elsewhere in the UK? I think it's very difficult to anticipate that because of the population changes south of the border. Um, excuse me, where there's a, a net immigration last year of over 300,000 people, and a lot of the figures will be influenced by the profile of those people. If they are people who are relatively well off and in, you know, with high levels of employment, and the indications are they will, may well be, a lot of these people tend to congregate in the southeast of England uh, rather than a high proportion come uh, north or to the north of England or to Scotland. And if that's the case statistically, it may well show actually an improvement in England because of the, um, that one impact. It may well do. I don't know because the research has not been completed. The figures have not been published. So I don't think it would be wise of me to try and forecast the outcome. And, and in terms of um, policy, uh, which policies do you see uh, that's been enacted by the government at the moment where we are redistributing uh, to those who most need it 
to, to, to narrow the poverty gap? Well, under this government, the social wage has increased enormously. I mean, in specifically in relation to children, uh, the expansion of childcare, I think, of all the things we've done, is probably the most important one. I think all the evidence shows that the extension of uh, free childcare is fundamentally important uh, to the life chances of children, but also actually helps the life chances of their parents as well. But there are many other policies, for example, the introduction of free school meals for P1, 2 and 3, I think that a fundamental uh, change uh, in many... Everyone gets that. Everyone gets that. Well, fine. It's not, yes. re not yes, redistributed. No, but, no, but the reason for free school meals uh, is that many of the people who were entitled to it under the old system didn't take it up. And now they are taking it up. Do you accept there's no redistributive element? No, I don't I'd accept that at all. So and the same with... Hold, 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 hold on a minute. You know, the, the, this is a, a discussion that, as a society and as a parliament, we do need to have. It's not germane to the topic that's before us. So, uh, Neil, is there anything else on the legislative consent motion? No. Right, OK, thanks. Claire? Um, Thank you, um, convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, I attended the um, conference yesterday in, on welfare um, uh, in Edinburgh, and we had contributions from one parent families who, of course, have produced a child poverty action plan along with CPAG and other stakeholders in this area, and income is a key element of what they're asking for. So I absolutely understand and agree with the government's um, position on the income. We also talked about the complexities going forward about a, a shared um, social security system going forward should the um, Scotland Bill be enacted. Um, and I just um, have a big concern about the lack of consultation prior to this from the government. And were you surprised that the um, devolved administrations weren't involved prior to this bill coming forward with its proposals? Well, unfortunately, it's par for the course. Uh, very often we're not consulted. I mean, a very good example, probably the best example, was during this uh, financial year when £100 million pounds was taken out of the Scottish government's budget without a buy your leave by the UK government. So when they tell us they treat us with respect, I have to say I take that with a large pinch of salt. Uh, of course, we should have been consulted, as indeed should have the Northern Ireland government and the Welsh government. And unfortunately, the Department of Work and Pensions, I think at times, parts of it, I don't think I've heard of the word devolution of power. And uh, forget, of course, that there are now uh, uh, three uh, other legislatures in, in the UK in addition to the one in London. So unfortunately, it was par for the course. But uh, So there's no surprises in that respect. But of course, we should have been... Uh, properly consulted. Okay, thank you. Um, just on that general principle of, of consultation then, um, you obviously feel strongly about it. Um, do you consult with local authorities, each individual local authority, before you make changes to their budget? Well, but we absolutely. I mean, for example, John Swinney and I uh, tomorrow morning have, I think in the last eight weeks, have had we'll have our fourth or fifth meeting with the COSLA leaders in relation to their budget, um, uh, which, of course, will be announced by John Swinney on the 16th of December. We've got very intense negotiations going on, and that's just at political level, convener, at official level, it's on a daily basis. But each individual council, do you discuss that with them? Well, obviously, each council, uh, what we do in the agreement is that COSLA negotiation, negotiates with us on behalf of local authorities uh, across Scotland. Um, so that, that is the system, and it's been the system for a long time. OK. Anyone else? If not, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his contribution? Pleasure. And uh, we'll suspend the meeting to allow the Cabinet Secretary to leave. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, agenda item three, consideration of the LCM. Um, we've heard the evidence from the Cabinet Secretary um, and committee has to report to Parliament on the LCM. Um, effectively, we need to indicate whether we are content with the terms of the legislative consent memorandum um, 
and are we content to report accordingly? Any views, comments? Claire? Everybody content? Okay, if that's the case, then we agree that. And we will now bring the public part of the meeting to a close. Uh, this is the last meeting of 2015, and we will reconvene on the 12th of January 2016 to consider the draft budget. Okay, thank you.